professors. You can watch the classes here every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern. Next, historian Joseph Ellis leads a seminar for high school teachers on the early years of the Revolutionary War through the letters of John and Abigail Adams. This class is at Amherst College and is hosted by the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. This is part two of a two part lecture. We last saw Abigail Adams giving birth to four children, five really, over a 12 year <coughs> period, really. And the question I asked you is how should we assess her role in the coming of the American Revolution? To what extent is it sexist or just the opposite of that to call attention to the fact that the dominant events in her life are biological rather than political? Um, if you're someone who wants to be true to the experience of women at this time, does that mean you are going to be not interested in the political story? That the political story for them is the biological story. You know what I'm getting at here. A couple of comments on this, if we possibly can. Yes, Mary Ellen? Where are you from, Mary Ellen? Um, west Chicago, 30 miles west of the city of Chicago. That's really West, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of Catherine Algor's book, Parlor Politics. Catherine Algor was a student of mine. Well, that makes sense why I enjoyed the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Parlor, so I, tell us what that is, Parlor Politics. Well, it's basically about how sort of people like Abigail Adams and Martha Washington sort of were working in other venues in political ways, whether it be in the parlors, through letters, mm. through correspondence, mm. to sort of make these connections and these networking con They're behind connections. behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, making mm -hmm. connections that were helpful to mm. their husbands, political careers, and oftentimes making connections that would be maybe unseemly for their husbands to make. I mean, if we read these letters about John, you know, it was sort of unseemly to be very overtly political and ambitious, but the women sort of behind the scenes sometimes hmm. networked and made connections. Catherine's book is mostly about early 19th century American yes, presidential yeah. politics, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but um, I'm, I'm just thinking of that applies but to in general, you can as apply. well. So the Dolly Madison principle, you, every, right. every guy needs a Dolly Madison to... Now, that, but see, Abigail ain't Dolly. Right. Abigail is like Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, Dolly's the one who, for whom they coined the term first lady. And Abigail's never a first lady. She's a, a co-partner in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense. And in that sense... But I'll tell you for sure, if you, if, you know, we could conjure her up, or even more historically legitimate, if we could just read her letters back to her sisters and everything about what's most important to her, her role as a mother and wife really are. I mean, she, and she doesn't think of that as constricting or anything like that. Um, that said, she straddles the public world She's reading these newspapers that John is writing for, and, and it's at this time, you can't get direct evidence of how influential she is. Later on, you get it, and you've got to assume that you didn't get it before because you know, you, you know, they were together at the same time. But that I read that she was herself part of the thought process that he was engaged in. And in fact, that in letters to certain women abroad, um, like there's um, a famous... Gosh, no, Joe, early Alzheimer's here, um, a Whig historian in Britain, and then um, Mercy Otis Warren. There is, in, in Abigail has a slightly different take on the British tyranny. It's operatic. It's like, dun, 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 dun. You know, it's like the forces of light and the forces of darkness kind of thing. And she talks about it in a more, and for her, this is interesting, for Adams, the ultimate evil is slavery not black slavery, that the British enslavement of us. For Abigail, guess what it is? Rape. That's what the ultimate horror would be, rape. So that she's got a feminist perception of what British tyranny feels like. 
that's, that's, that is different from his. But I do think noticing that her life is dominated by pregnancy and child rearing isn't a disservice to women of the world or to the, sex, to the uh, feminist agenda. It's, it's a recognition of that's a central part of it. Make me, make me feel good about the fact that I'm not crazy about this. Do you agree or do I disagree? Yes. Well, I Kate. I mean, just in the um, the John series mini series we were watching last night, there was a scene where she's you know talking about politics, and she says, "Politics is my empty shelves." You know, mm. it's the fact that I miss you know there's no coffee, or there's you know I can't feed my kids. Mm. Where I think she's a woman. I mean, she was living the daily life, but she was intelligent enough to mm. make the connections about why this was happening. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. question. Who is in greater physical danger by the time you get to the middle 70s? Abigail. I think so, too. That she is up in Boston, and the Boston is occupied by the British Army, and there's a smallpox epidemic that probably already had started, but that is now amplified by the presence of troops and um, and unclean conditions. There's a wonderful book called um, Pox Americana, P O X Americana. Some of you are smiling. Even it so happens that the War of Independence coincides with a huge smallpox epidemic, and you've got to believe that they interact because you've got people living, you know, in in, in bringing contagion in. The British Army contain, contains most guys who have immunity. The American Army doesn't have immunity. And so one of the biggest things that Washington does is to require all soldiers before going online to be inoculated. Um, okay. I do think she's, she's at greater risk. There is a scene where she leads John Quincy by the hand up Penn's Hill, and we'll be able to see Penn's Hill on Thursday, to watch the Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775. And then she writes a letter to John about this. And the Battle of Bunker Hill is a big battle, not just in terms of the casualty rates. The British really lose over half their attack force. The political effect on each side is really pronounced. What's the political effect on the Americans? Hey, we can beat these guys. If they'll just come attack us while we stand behind these breastworks, we can kill a lot of them, okay? <laughs> they miss, they overinterpret this military, in terms of mili- their, the capacity to deal with the, the British Army. British interpretation. We cross the Rubicon. This is now a violent struggle, and we can't compromise anymore. There's no sense of compromise. And at this point, George III really says, we're going to lay it to these guys. All these wounded people come back into London and their wives are standing at the dock and the newspapers are covering it. You know, it's like huge casualty rates on the British side. Say, okay. You guys started this? We're going to finish it. And it's at that moment, no, it, that he, right, the, prohibition, the Prohibitory Act comes, they close the British, uh, they close American ports. Um, they, um, uh, cons- they confiscate all debt, and he goes to the British Ministry and says, "I want you to raise an army to include at least ten thousand professional soldiers from either Prussia or Russia." And they say, "Well, Prussia is better, and so we'll get the." But that's how you get the Hessians, and they they create a thirty-two thousand man army, ten thousand navy. 42,357 ships, and they get ready to sail in the largest expeditionary force ever to cross the Atlantic. And the next time 
you get one this big is World War I when we go across. This is a huge force. It's designed to deliver a massive blow and end this, this silliness once and forever. Okay? And it comes very much in the wake of Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill, probably the most important battle in the war, and it happens before we declare independence. Okay. Um, okay. Um, where are we? We're in Ad- Abigail's personal career, or personal career during this time. In, the, in March of 76, she writes this letter that's become famous, and I now understand from uh, Roseanne that you talked about this yesterday afternoon a little bit. I do think we should talk about it as much as we possibly can today, too. Um, it's the Remember the Ladies letter. And what page is it on in the... In the uh, in the formal reading. I think it's page, let me see if I can, page 110, okay? Um, And it's a letter, it's about a bunch of other things, you know, about buying things at the store, about what the markets are like and everything else. And all of a sudden, she says, by the way, piece of advice, whenever you get a letter that says, by the way, (laughs) Look out, baby, <laughs> because something is coming that, oh, by the way, you know, means, and who's got it in front? Anybody got that in front of them? Maureen, you got it? Okay. Uh, get the mic up to Maureen. Maureen, read the part that says, by the way. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. That's good. Okay. Now, there's other letters after this that usually don't get cited in most anthologies. He responds to this, and my recollection is he says, you know, let's be serious here. We know that women are the real tyrants, you know, that uh, women control the family with monarchical power, and and, um, and I will not be, what is it, some, despotism. the despotism of the petticoat. <laughs> I love that. And, um, um, and eventually they reach, there's a, there's a kind of several volleys here that, again, <coughs> don't, and they sort of, she's got a couple of, a letter to Mercy Otis Warren in the same time, basically says, well, Mercy, maybe you and I ought to write a letter to the, to the Massachusetts uh, General Court saying we don't intend to pay taxes because we are being taxed without our consent. Um, then they sort of need to reach some sort of Compromise. I mean, John's got to find a way to make this okay, you know. And he says, you know, we can all agree that women do have a role, an important role to play that needs to be acknowledged, and that is in terms of education. And therefore, I'm in favor. The revolution is going to mean an increase of schools for women, and that's going to happen. They're going to call them dame schools. Um, And so can we agree on something here, you know? There are two agenda going on here, and her agenda, and what she was really saying, and the context in the Continental Congress in the spring of '76. Let's take her agenda first, and then I'll put it. I'll try to put it in context, and we'll see what sense we can make of it. One interpretation, plausible to me. She's kidding. This is banter. This is why if you look back at the early letters, they're always bantering. You know, what, how does, what, what, you know, this thing that you objected to uh, about uh, his, his phrase, David, you know, like in one of these letters, he, he, what is he, my, he, his way of referring to her. It's, they play in roles here, okay? You know, and her role now is to sort of stick it to you and... Um, but um, 
let's not make too much of this, okay? Uh, there's a great poem uh, called Terence. This is stupid, stupid stuff by a British poet. And it's like, people, you know, let's, let's, not, t- let's not take this too seriously. Uh, it sounds good. They put it in the feminist ed- uh, anthologies, and everybody thinks that Abigail's a feminist. And okay, that's fine. But really, that's really not what's going on here. These are very close people playing word, word games, and he's getting a, getting a kind of shakedown from her. Yeah, but I think she's serious. Can you be bantering and serious at the same time? No. Yes! <laughs> Aaron says yes. And, um, that's marriage. That's <laughs> marriage. <laughs> Aaron, do you speak from great experience in this regard? Ah, Aaron says that what we're seeing here is a recognizably modern marriage uh, in which people are bantering, but also trying to make a point about the struct, about the nature of their relationship. Now, if you say there's a serious dimension to this, and I agree, it seems to me there is, having lived through marriage and stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Is this a direct assault on patriarchy? What does that mean? Patriarchy is the Western tradition's belief that women are inferior and that man, that Property cannot be held by a woman in a marriage, and that the household, the, the male is the leader of the household and defines the identity of everybody in it. I'm sure you can get even a fuller definition of patriarchy, but male supremacy, female subordination. I mean, is that what she's saying? What do you say, Aaron? We'll let you have a, a, a go with this, and then Yassine, too. I don't know that it's so much an attack on Patriot. As I almost wonder, as I read some of those things, if it's just not some of Abigail's frustrations. She's at home with young mm. children. There's a scene last night that we watched in the miniseries where she's scrubbing the floor kind of angrily as he's getting she's ready doing to it with leave vinegar again. because she's the, of the smallpox. Right, yeah. because of the smallpox. But she's doing it in a sort of passive. I mean, she's just kind of really scrubbing and kind of giving him a face about it. And I wonder if some of some hmm. of the banter in here is is not necessarily an attack on on patriarchy, but almost just a <sighs> I'm tired and I'm kind of frustrated with my current role, and not because I, she doesn't want to serve in that role, but more as a... So it's Betty Friedan. Uh, uh, may, maybe. I don't know. I mean... It's an early version of Betty Friedan. <laughs> I'm sitting home eating chocolate-covered cherries, in her case, but uh, um, that I'm not, you know, my life is not interesting enough. Hmm. I, I don't know. I just think she continues... Sounds too presentistic, doesn't it? I, I just... But I almost kind of wonder about, just in some of the things that you read from her, if, if that isn't just some of their their playfulness, some of their Mm. relationship. I Mm. I don't know. Mm. Okay, okay, but we agree that there's banter here, but there's a very serious dimension. The fact that they banter doesn't mean that she doesn't mean what she says. that's not what I'm saying. And what I am asking here is what she says, is what she says a direct frontal assault on the central assumptions of patriarchy, which is a more radical feminist position than, say, we want the vote, okay? Like, in the 19th century, the whole women's movement gets taken over by the right to vote. And there's all kinds of other things going on that women needed to be paying attention to. But, and I'm saying, she's deeper than just give me the vote, right. you know? Michael, this is a guy named after my son. <laughs> this is Michael Ellis, okay? Got a, got a mic for Michael? Oh, excuse me, Essen, you're over here, and so... Michael, hold on, hold on. You know that because you're named after my son, you're going to definitely get privileged treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I would say that it is an assault on on patriarchy. You would good. Um, I would say her use of, you know, her her comparing men to tyrants is, mm. is an example of that. I, I would say that 
you know, she's using the, her 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 closeness to her husband to lobby mm -hmm. for women to try and make change. Mm -hmm. um, the letter that she writes to Mercy Otis Warren after she writes this letter is a tell sign to me, tell tell sign to me that she's she's going further than just banter, and mm. it's beyond just talking to her husband. It's Maybe we can foment a movie. You read that differently than I do, but I understand your reading then. Yes, I mean, I was painting, saying, well, you know, she's talking to her buddy, Mercy Otis Warren, who's the most liter literate, historically informed woman in America, who's the first person to write a three-volume history of the American Revolution, in which she doesn't feature John with sufficient <laughs> significance, and he gets all upset with her. Or well, maybe Abigail tainted her, her, her perception of John. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but you read it Absolutely, yes. This is a frontal assault on patriarchy and meaning a radical, a need for a radical restructuring of American society in order to, I'm reading, I'm imposing this on you, Justin, but would you agree with this, that the agenda of the American Revolution requires <laughs> fundamental change in gender relationships? She sees an opening. And she sees an opening. Right. I've seen an opening and I'm going to take it. And she, she tries at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Wait a minute. We've got to get to Michael here. Okay. Give, get Michael the mic here. Here, I'll get it for him. I'm over here. Michael. You. Now, you don't screw up, Michael. My own son's name is at stake. <laughs> a lot of pressure. Yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. A lot of pressure, baby. <laughs> I think, uh, I agree this is an, an attack, but I think it's less a frontal assault and more a flank attack where it's... Frontal assault and the flank attack. You, I think Yassine doesn't disagree completely. Right. And I you think can send some men to the front and some men to the side, just as you can be bantering and serious at the same time. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's not It's not like a opening in the front, an obvious opening. Well, but. here's... Here's follow up on that. This is uh, this is good. This is good. My son would be so proud of you. I'm trying really hard. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> How does she raise her daughter? Untraditional. Like like mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Be a good wife. Be a good wife. Yeah. In fact, that's a failure she like has that. because she is a good wife and she marries a shit. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, but um, and um, um, does she ever try to vote? Does she do it? Say, what's the woman in France uh, who writes it? Uh, huh? The feminist de Beauvoir. Uh, uh, you know, leave her husband, carve out a life for her own. I mean, here's what I'm getting at. Like, Abigail is so far ahead of history that if she were to try to act this out now, she would have to become a single alienated person. This would have to be what she decides her life is. She's not going to do that, okay? For her, the reward comes from family. It comes from being a mother and a, and a wife and from being a, an, an active pol political person, too, but that she's, she's not going to attempt to live out a feminist agenda because she's rooted in her, she herself is a traditional New England wife and mother. She is. That's where she derives the bulk of her status, of her fulfillment. At least that's what she says over and over again. Um, so, well, what this does make clear is why is she having these ideas? The woman I was trying to think of is Mary Wollstonecraft. Okay? Um, Ab John reads Mary Wollstonecraft on the French Revolution. She, he starts reading it out loud to Abigail. Well, this is in, later in the 1790s. And he goes nuts. And if you go to the Boston Public Library, and you, that's where the, look, John's library is, his books. Um, the marginalia in Mary Wollstonecraft's book is almost as many words as is in the book. I am not kidding. Okay. <laughs> thou flee, thou wretch, thou understandest not humankind. And um, 
anyway, that what the what Abigail's letter really is is the is a statement about how one woman's thinking is being affected by the values being described in the American Revolution. And that what she's saying is, by the way, John, all the arguments you're making about British tyranny have implications that you don't seem to understand. John says, "Uh, I do understand him. Now shut up, because we cannot take those into account now. And if you allow that agenda, that radical agenda that's implicit in our argument, we're going to kill the revolution in the cradle. Well, what agenda? Well, he's getting letters, you see. He's in the center of the wind tunnel in Philadelphia from former slaves and current slaves saying, and as I was saying to some people outside at the break, you know, they're they're heartbreaking because they're they're written by people who aren't completely literate. But they're basically saying, you know, it does seem to me that the the tyranny you describe is present among us as well. And that unless and until you're willing to take slavery on directly, then you're going to be vulnerable to the charge of hypocrisy. He's get, he doesn't have to think this himself. This is coming into him on his email account, okay? <laughs> Second group of people, artisans in Philadelphia. Where's Philadelphia? Philadelphia! <laughs> They're saying, uh, by the way, we are the major sources of support for the revolution in Pennsylvania. These Quakers, you know, all they're going to do is sit this thing out. And, um, and we can't vote because we don't own property because we're not farmers. So, and we got this guy going to speak for us who's pretty good named Tom Payne. And we got to have the vote. And we would argue that we have to end the property qualification to vote. <laughs> So we're going to end slavery, we're going to end the property qualification to vote, and now, of all people, Abigail says, and by the way, (laughs) we also need to end patriarchy, and at least begin to recognize that the values we espouse call for an equality between the sexes that is a revolution. And okay, let's do it slowly, let's be responsible about it, but that the American Revolution has powerful radical implications. And Abigail's job is to say to John, one of them is, by the way, women, what's interesting is John's response. And we wouldn't have it if we didn't have the family correspondence. Interesting. John is a conservative revolutionary. Let me tell you, if you want to have revolutionaries that succeed, you want them to be conservative. The most most revolutionaries are radical. Revolutionary, Robespierre, down the tubes, baby. (laughs) And um, she's smiling. She must have said something like this yesterday, Roseanne. And um, anyway, he wants there to be, he's, he's a real radical on the issue of American independence. Ahead of all the moderates, okay? By the way, speak my by the way, okay? Was there a way to avoid this in the 1775 period? Just before Bunker Hill, okay? Could we, look, in retrospect, all right? We're just looking back. The only real advantage that historians have is hindsight, right? Hindsight. This is the biggest diplomatic blunder in the history of British statecraft. They're going to lose a North American empire. They're going to suffer mm, 30 or 40,000 casualties, which is a lot for them. Now, it's not going to be fatal. The sun will not set on the British empire until the 20th century. Their golden days are really still ahead of it. But it's a big loss. And 
it was unnecessary. What do I mean it was unnecessary? There's an answer to this problem. It's looking right at them. And they can't grab it. William Pitt tells them what the answer is in the House of Lords in the fall of 1774. Edmund Burke tells them what the answer is in the House of Commons shortly thereafter. This is a no-brainer. All we got to do is say, okay, you guys can tax yourself and legislate for yourself. You stay in the empire economically because it's in your advantage and we're gonna tar- you're going to have to pay tariffs, but that's okay. You pay them anyway, but you get the benefit of a market. This is a good deal for you. And you recognize that you are under the protective canopy of the British monarch. You recognize the legitimacy of the British monarch. Guess what that is? That's the British Commonwealth. They figured this out 100 years later. That's the reason Australia and Canada stay in the empire. India for a while. They can't do it in 1775. Why? Two reasons. Central to the British mentality is the political think thought of Blackstone, great British jurist, who has said, and everybody believes this is true, this is as true as a principle from Aristotle on to the present. In every political unit, and whether it's a nation or an empire, there has to be one final, all-powerful source of sovereignty. A place where all critical and controversial questions can go for resolution. Otherwise, chaos. What the colonists are proposing is multiple sovereignties. Over here, they get to decide their stuff. Over here, we get to decide it. That's no good. It's a recipe for chaos. Aside, what's the Constitution but multiple sovereignties? Some for the state, some for the Fed. Blur. The, the great thing is blurring. Okay? Ambiguity. They, somebody smart, Burke knew this. Edmund Burke knew this, I think. Anyway, this was a mischance. Why didn't they do it? Because of Blackstone, because of the sovereignty question. The other reason, we don't need to do it. We can just send an army over there and squash those son of a guns like that. And that's what we're going to do. Why should we com- compromise when we have the military power to resolve this decisively? And that's the reason there's no turning back after you get to the Battle of Bunker Hill. They have moved in a military direction. The troops are getting ready to come. And in the summer of 1776, which we're now entering, on May 15th, 1776, just about six weeks after Abigail sends her letter, John writes the this thing, this thing, this prelude to a request to be sent to all the colonial governors. If you read the request, it's got certain language in it that sounds sort of like the Declaration of Independence. You know, we've been patient, prudence dictates. It says each colony should now begin the process of rewriting its colonial constitution from a colonial constitution to a state constitution. This is a referendum, a de de facto referendum on independence. Adams goes to his grave believing 
that he wrote the real Declaration of Independence. <laughs> that Jefferson's late, late thing, uh, six weeks later, whatever, is like the thunder after the lightning has struck. Okay? He was the lightning. Now, of course, it's convenient to believe that it's you. It's, you know, and Adams' vanity is always pretty, pretty obvious. But I'm telling you, he's got a case here, okay? He's got a pretty good case. Okay. They send this to each colony, right? By the way, you'll, anybody from Rhode Island? <laughs> Rhode Island comes through here. It's the only time in an entire story that Rhode Island <laughs> actually does what it's supposed to do. Okay, And we have the documents that were generated in the response to this request. And they come in in June and into, into July. Massachusetts, for example... We're in Massachusetts, so we think they're important. There's like 38 towns that respond. The governor sends it to the assembly. The assembly sends it to all the towns. In Virginia, they don't have towns. They have counties. They send it to all the counties. But in Massachusetts, they got 38 towns. We have the response of all 38 towns. This is like you don't get this very often in early American history. This is like a poll on independence, right? Because they're supposed to say, do they support, are they going to rewrite their constitution from a colonial to a state? Because the, the resolution on which the Continental Congress is going to vote comes from Virginia... It's written at about the same time as this is this May 15th document is written. And it's sent to the con- the full Continental Congress on June June 7th. It says that and this is what they're going to vote on that these united colonies are and have every right to be independent states. That's going to be the vote. That's going to be what they vote in independence. Now notice, we do not rebel as a nation. We rebel as a series of states. <laughs> but that the request in May of 76 by each colony cum state is a request, are you willing to go with us? Okay. And there are some historians that have said, well, that's not really what it is. It's not a reference. That is what it is. You know? That doesn't mean that's what... I mean, Adams thought it was that. Anyway, what do they say? I haven't read every one, but I've read every one in Massachusetts. They all say, almost all say, exactly the same thing. First of all, they say, you know, people in Topps Field say... This is the biggest thing we've been asked to consider in a long time. Like, normally we meet to discuss whether the pigs can be allowed to move on to the commons or that kind of thing. And then they say, if you had asked us this question a year ago, we would have said, what are you talking about? This would have been an un necessary, ridiculous question. Of course not. We have a loyalty to the British Empire and the British King. But everything's changed. You're asking us whether we want to essentially declare independence. We have no choice. He has already declared his independence of us. Which he has. And he's sending these foreign... They love to talk about the foreign troops, the Hessians. Because the Hessians are famous for taking no prisoners. Mm -hmm. And for raping all women. (coughs) Not totally justified, but somewhat justified. And so they got these scenarios going. 
There's one town in Massachusetts of the 38 that says, we're not sure about this, and they're out on the Cape. And they're like, the, the British fleet is liable to land here, and then we're in trouble if we've taken the wrong position. It's a close vote there anyway, but um, everybody else basically says that we have no choice, that the British themselves are responsible for having created this intractable situation. George III is himself responsible. Now, I know it sounds, I mean, that's old historiography on this. Back in the 19th century, I blame George III. Then in the 19th and late 19th and 20th century, it gets much more complicated. In the end, it's really simple. It is George III. George III has tried to recover and res- his, his monarchy, the power of the monarch. He's, tried, he's decided to impose British rule on the colonies in a way that is ahistorical that is, and that is unprecedented. And he thinks he can get away with it. And he thinks it's going to be easy. And he thinks he's going to win the war. And he's wrong on all counts. Um, and the British Ministry and the British House of Commons pretty much go along with him. There's no opposition, to be sure. But the real source of leadership in Britain is from the top down. In London, people hate this. London's opposed to the war. They enjoy American commerce. They got a lot of American friends. And they're going to be a source of anti-war, movement, of anti-war sentiment throughout the American Revolution. But that's how it happens. How does the Declaration get written? And there we come back to Adams. Okay, this would be a good essay question, just in you know simple narrative. Like, tell us how, tell me how the Declaration of Independence comes into existence and is written, starting on June seventh and ending on July. Fourth. Why do I say June seventh? June seventh is the day the Continental Congress takes up the Virginia Resolution, puts it on the docket that these United Colonies are and have every right to be independent states. Okay, several of the colonies uh, have representatives that are under strict orders from their state legislature or governor not to vote on independence until they come back and get the assent and support of the legislatures there, especially in New York and Pennsylvania. So they say, recess so that members can go back. While the recess is going on, we're going to appoint three committees, and Adam is going to be on two of them. Actually, Yes, he's on two of them. He's done on all three. One is a committee of five. Adams, Franklin, Jefferson. Who are the other two guys? They're less... Huh? Robert Livingston or William Livingston? I think it's Robert. Yeah. And Connecticut guy. Who is it? Roger Sherman. Roger Sherman. One of the most boring talkers in the history of American eloquence. But he, he's like, if you look at all the scenes in American, early American, he's in every one. He's there, you know, and, and anyway. Roger Sherman. And this is a committee designed to draft a document that if we vote independence and have to announce it to the world, this will be the document that announces that fact. Okay? Second committee, if we decide for independence, we sort of have to have a government that, that represents us after we throw off British rule. Therefore, let's appoint a big, a big committee, 13 people, one from every colony, to serve on this. John Dickinson would be the chair of this. Think about this. This is like, they say, well, we're going to just figure out what kind of government we're going to have. <laughs> they don't understand. It's like, this simple matter. We'll meet a couple times to figure out what kind of government we're going to have. <laughs> and um, no way this is going to work. And they're going to discover this. Third committee, chaired by John. 
called a Committee on Treaties. We've got to have a foreign policy for a nation. But even more specifically, we, once we declare our independence, we've got to get allies, European allies, primarily Belle France. And therefore, what can we do to encourage French support and what are the outlines for an American foreign policy? John writes this single-handedly. It is really good because he announces the basic principle of American foreign policy is going to hold true until the 20th century. We're going to have commercial relations with everybody, but be diplomatically and otherwise isolated from the rest of the world. That's in our interest. Sounds good, you know. Sounds pretty simple, but that's the, <laughs> but that's the way it be. And so, Washington's farewell address is really a comment on what John Adams has already decided. All right. This committee meets. This five-person committee meets a couple times in Franklin's chambers because Franklin has the gout. He's always got the gout. You know, as far as I can tell, he's got the gout later on, too. And they first, we're reconstructing this. One of the problems is every, because this becomes so important, there, everybody starts telling stories about it later in their lives, right? And Adam has got a version, most of which is a lie, untrue. <laughs> and then Jefferson's got a version. It's sort of hypocritical. And Franklin's pens are to have his versions. And so it's like, huh. I'm offering you distilled wisdom. No, I'm offering you <laughs> pr what seems the most plausible version of all these gossipy stories. The natural choice, well, who is the chair of the committee? The real, Adam says it's me. They actually don't have one. They don't appoint a chair of this group. Adam's acts as if he were the chair because somebody's got to do that the natural person to pick to write the declaration is Franklin the best pro stylist in America the most famous American of his time by far the equivalent of a Nobel Prize winning scientist got friends in England, friends in France. Wow! Franklin says, I refuse to do it. Why? I'm not feeling well. <laughs> I got the gout. Plus, and this is a great line, I have made it a rule never to write anything that will be edited by a committee. <laughs> <laughs> Would that we all could live under that. <laughs> and therefore, no. Adam says they then turn to him to write it. Why? Because he's the leading spokesman for the independent position in the Continental Congress and has been for the last year. He's been ahead of the game. History, as he said was going to happen, is happening. Breaking with England impossible to imagine, now inevitable. He says, I don't want to do this. I got, I'm on like 38 committees, okay? I'm also serving as the head of the Board of War and Ordnance. That is a big deal. That is like Secretary of War, okay, Secretary of Defense. And even though we haven't declared independence, the war started and we got this invasion happening. Oh, my God. And so I got a lot on my plate. Plus, now he's the one who says this. I have made myself obnoxious. <laughs> Nobody else calls him his obnoxious. He calls himself obnoxious because he has upset people by being an insistent supporter of the radical position with regard to independence. People like Dickinson. And he's written letters that have been captured by the British fleet and released that are not kindly letters about, about Dickinson. He said, oh, 
later on he says, I told you this, if he was John Dickinson and he had Dickinson's wife and Dickinson's mother, he would have committed suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Dickinson's a victim of his Quaker mother and Quaker wife. He says no. What about Jefferson? Well, oh, okay, Jefferson. It's like an afterthought. This is one of the most significant accidents in American history. Jefferson has been the guy who does the drafting behind-the-scenes guy. He never speaks in public or even in committee. But Adam, but Jeff, Adam says he's always there when you need him. He's a loyal supporter of independence. No question about that. It's just that he's got a reedy, low voice. Nobody can hear him. And he seems to compensate for his rhetorical deficiencies on his feet by being a pretty good writer. So, yeah, Jefferson. Jefferson says, okay, before I leave, before we end the second meeting, can we at least outline the, the document that we think you want me to write? So they do that. They say there ought to be a preface that justifies us, our cause on the principles, that says we've been patient, and then that goes forward and we've got plenty of models for this. The Bill of Indictment against George III, following the Bill of Indictment against Charles I and other British monarchs in, in history. If you're a monarch in British history and you see, you know, like I said before, if you see the sentence, you know, by the way, <laughs> if you're a monarch and you see a paragraph that begins, wherefore? <laughs> Get out of town fast <laughs> because they're about ready to come for your head. And so, yeah, you write that, that kind of thing. And um, so he spends a couple of, well, it's hard to know. They, they meet, this gets written in the third week of June. It's written on the second floor of an apartment on 7th and Philadelphia, 7th and Market. 7th and Market Street. It's Deacon Gate. It's Mark. You go there now. There's nobody else in the room. He's writing it on a portable desk that was made by a former slave. Did God appear? Not to our knowledge. <laughs> Did tongues of fire appear? We do not think so. <laughs> What books did he have? Not many. He's got the copy of the Virginia Constitution that's being written, mostly the preface by George Mason. That's where you get pursuit of happiness. What is the document that he's referring to implicitly when he says, life, liberty, and what does Locke say? Locke's second, second treatise on government says, property. property, life, liberty, and property. He drops property. You can build an entire arsenal on the implications of this change. <laughs> because what does property protect? Slavery. If you knock out property then slave owners will not be able to say that they are protected. And therefore, in the Virginia Constitution, it says, life, liberty, property, and the right to pursue your happiness. Jefferson drops property. <sighs> Is this a conscious act to make the revolution an anti-slavery movement? Oops. Yeah, maybe. What does Jefferson mean by pursuit of happiness? Uh, again, we could write a metaphysical doctrine on this, a treatise that would go forever. 
But what he means, I think, is that property and wealth isn't necessarily the only or the highest um, interest and source of fulfillment for human beings. Um, so in that sense, not only is it anti-slavery, it's anti-capitalist. <laughs> see how you can, you know, you can uh, obviously, this is like early Marx and all that. Yeah, that's, but, um, okay. About the slavery thing, you're going to ask about this. Yes, let me say something. There's later in the document, among the things deleted, maybe this is what you were going to say, that a long paragraph... Give it to him. Yeah, let him do it. There's a long paragraph deleted in the Declaration that basically condemns slavery and blames, blames it King on George, yeah, blame King George the Third. Isn't this a great thing, though? Look, what a great revolutionary idea. We got this problem called slavery. We know it's wrong. We know we got to get rid of it. Let's blame it all on George the Third. We're blaming him for everything else under God's green earth at this moment. We might as well throw that one right on the funeral pyre, okay? So blame it on him. They delete it because the way he structures it, first of all, they don't want any mention of slavery in this document, the same way they don't want to mention it in the Constitution. But secondly, the way he phrases it is awkward because he refers to the fact that the governor of Virginia, the king's representative, has offered emancipation to all the slaves in Virginia who come to him at this moment. Well, that's kind of weird. You know, like, he blames it on George III, but then he says this, and it confuses it, because it basically says the British are the ones willing to end slavery, and we're not. What he's really tried to say is their motives for doing it are not good. Blah, 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 blah. All right. He finishes the draft. Uh-oh, we didn't pass this out. On the back of this, pass these around. On the back of this, I can't move too far, so pass these around, if you would. There is a portrait. We've got an artist coming in this afternoon named Paul Stady, who is the leading American, which means world expert, on the art of the American Revolution. <laughs> he really is. Let's hope he's articulate. And um, <laughs> he is. He's a good friend. Anyway. There is a famous portrait by John Trumbull, that original of which appears... Or is now available in the rotunda of the Congress of the United States, but you've seen it, okay? And if you Google this sucker, it says, John Trumbull, title of the, patri- the portrait, Declaration of Independence. And then a lot of places it says, July 4th, 1776, which makes eminent sense, right? Wrong. You can get them on this. You, you will win Jeopardy on this. <laughs> it's June 28th. Everybody thinks it's a picture of the signing of the Declaration. They're coming up to it. They got it in their heads. The play, right? 1776. The end of the play. Dun, 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 the <laughs> clock is not, you know, rhyming. They're all coming up to sign their names. Never happened. They never signed it on the 4th. They never signed it at one time together. Most people signed it on August 2nd and 4th, but there are people signing it in October. So what is this, this picture? It's a picture of the Committee of Five delivering the draft to the full Congress. You got Adams there, you got Franklin there, you got Jefferson, and then you got the other two guys, Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. And the guy at the desk is John Hancock. What happens, they deliver this draft. On the 28th. Okay, we got the draft. We've got the resolution preceding this on, you know, 
<coughs> let's vote on the resolution. Do these colonies are and have a right to be independent states. Adams, excuse me, um, John Dickinson argues against eloquently. We have shreds of his speech basically saying this is suicidal. Once we do this, there's no turning back and the chances of us winning this war are remote in the extreme. If you do it, I'm going to fight for you on, on our side. Don't get me wrong about that. And he leaves right after the vote to join the New Jersey militia, which is rallying in defense of the attack coming in Staten Island and Long Island. Who gets up to defend independence? Our boy. It's, suppose it's the most consequential speech he ever gave and everybody, including Jefferson, says it was brilliant, and we don't know what he said. <laughs> Nobody wrote it down. They made generalizations about it. But we can sort of say, you know, I told you, know, he didn't say I told you so, but there's no turning back, but we can win, but blah, 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 blah. But we don't know what he said. The vote's on July 2nd. The vote is overwhelmingly positive. It's 12-0-1. New York with, with, is in abeyance because they can't be sure what the legislature will do on this. Um, where's, my, where's my copy of doo -doo 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 -doo, the book? Oh, it's right in here. Who's got the book? Oh, in there. Easy. Um, I want to read the letter from John to Abigail on July 3rd. He says as he trims to find it. 121. Thank you. 121. Where have I got my glasses? Um, this is the letter in which he's talking about the implications. Um, it's July. Well, well, here it is. It's 125. The second day of July... 1776, he's writing this on the 3rd, will be the most memorable epica in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations. He even gets the fireworks right. <laughs> from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward, forevermore. Everything perfect, except he gets the day wrong. I was, Chris. I always point out to my students that July 2nd is my birthday. My <laughs> Chris says he always tells his students that it really is July 2nd because it's your birthday, and Correct. you're right. <laughs> you know, you're right. I presume you're right about your birthday, but uh, also <laughs> that you can make a pretty strong case that it should be the, 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 the proper date is the, is the second. Well, how does it end up the fourth? Printing. Mary Ellen? Printing. Is that what you said? Oh, no. Aaron, excuse me, Aaron. Printing, Aaron. Go with that. Yes. It was sent to the printer. It was sent to the printer on the 4th, and then the printer July 4th on top. wrote across the top of the document, printed July 4th. So when the document sent out to everybody else, all the other newspapers and foreign governments and dignitaries, it says July 4th. Therefore, we celebrate July 4th. Now... I would like to make the case that we've been celebrating the wrong date for a heck of a long time here. <laughs> that it should be the second. That's when they actually voted on independence. But I am not prepared to sort of make the case, you know, like we're going to take Hamilton off the $10 bill or uh, you know, we're going to change the date of... Because I believe that both Adams and Jefferson 
recognizing this mistake, <coughs> chose to correct it in their own decisions, and we have to respect that. What am I talking about, Chris? When they died. That when they died, <laughs> therefore, Chris, you know the day you got to die on now, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, now, you know, can you pick your own day? You know, like, nah. But then, July 4th, both of them, 50th anniversary. You can't make that kind of stuff up, man. (laughs) Guess what? Monroe dies on the 4th, too. Madison dies, I think, on the 28th of June. He's getting there, but he can't quite make it, you know? Like... These guys willed their own death. <laughs> what are Jefferson's last words? It is it the is it the fourth? <laughs> That's what he's thinking about. Okay. Um, Adams's last words: Thomas Jefferson still lives or survives. It's two versions. That's not made up. There's people in the room that testified at that moment. That's not actually. And Jefferson has died at 12.30 that same day. Adams dies about 4.30 in the afternoon. Well, they made it right. And then Thoreau made it right. Thoreau went out to Walden on the 4th. (laughs) Lee made it right. He retreated from Gettysburg on the 4th. Before that, the, the, the Louisiana Purchase arrived in Washington on July 4th, 1803. Something big is going to happen in our lifetimes on the fourth term. I mean, they make it all right. We just keep making the fourth happen. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to conclude our deliberations today on the Declaration by offering an alternative declaration as it might have been written by John Adams. And you have the te- text before you. And um, if we had a projector here, we'd throw it up on the screen. We don't have a projector. We do, but I don't use that kind of stuff. And um, and, um, what I'm trying to call attention to here, I'll be specific in a second, is the way in which Jefferson's draft of the Declaration and the most famous parts of it, the ones that are the most important words in American history, the 55 words that begin... Well, that are. We hold these truths to be self evident. Self evident. What the hell does that mean? He didn't write that initially. He wrote, We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. Mm-hmm. That got changed by the committee. It's the only thing the committee changed. Probably Franklin. You can hear Franklin saying, We don't need God in this deal, okay? <laughs> Um, self-evident, okay. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Really? That's nonsense. Of course they're not. I mean, you mean men and women? Okay, men and women are created. No, they're rich people, they're poor people, they're ugly people, and they're pretty people, and they're lucky people, and they're unlucky people. But somehow, okay, we'll, we'll hold, hold that off. We'll how does it go? No, no, that's the that's. I started the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator. Uh oh, here he comes again, with certain inalienable rights. What's inalienable? Why do we have to use big words like that? That means you can't take them away, right? Certain inalienable rights. That among these rights, guess what? That means there might be others too. We haven't even thought of yet. Among these rights are life. We get that. Yep. All right. That's pretty good. Liberty. Hmm. 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 For who? Hmm. That's tricky. That's really an expansive mandate. But okay. It's revolutionary moments call for incantations of this sort. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oh, my God. Really? Everybody gets to pursue their happiness? We have noted in earlier discussions that this has implications that neither Adams nor Jefferson nor anybody else at that moment thought. And the implications of this will get included in the Constitution and eventually, most 
potently in the 14th Amendment with regard to rights of citizenship mm -hmm. and will be the basis for the decisions in Brown versus Board of Education and to overthrow Plessy versus Ferguson on segregation and most recently, I don't even remember the name, the, what's the name of the gay, gay marriage decision? Ogofeld. Ogofeld. See, it hasn't got famous yet. You know, it will eventually because it's going to be in the books and everything because it's a landmark case. But the, 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 this is language which has implications that no one at the time understood. But that <coughs> in the same way we saw Abigail calling attention to the <coughs> gender implications for families and for patriarchy, this, even more than Abigail and John ever knew, has implications. Life and everybody that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. What's the rent then? Huh? Yeah. The government. Deriving their, Deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. This is a big deal here, okay? If we say that there's question about whether the American Revolution is a revolution, and if we say that the mere secession from the British Empire doesn't qualify. <coughs> there is buried here a nuclear weapon that has revolutionary implications. Namely, that until this moment in history, in medieval Europe at least, political power has flowed downward from God to monarchs and then to the people. God speaks to the monarchs. Can you imagine they're having George III has a conversation with God every day? Yeah? <laughs> this is the kind of thing Thomas Paine made fun of in Common Sense. Oh, George III's over there talking to the God. <laughs> George III's really a banditti. His, the whole Habsburg line is a bunch of crooks that got the crown in an illegal way. You know. Anyway, but that the whole argument about the flow of political power is reversed. It doesn't flow from the top down. It flows from the bottom up. And, and what's the name of the senator from Kentucky who's running for president? Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Ron Paul. This is where he really has a point, where he's going to be happy as dog squat, okay? Because what's the sovereign unit in this new arrangement? The people, but... All men are created equal. It's the individual. Like, I have rights. You can't take them away from me. And if you do so illegally, I can overthrow your government. Right? That's the argument here. And it's not like you get to decide what rights I have. I get to decide what rights you have as a government to, to, to limit my freedom. Now, if you take this seriously, we're talking anarchy, baby. <laughs> this is a utopian vision. And I think that the vast majority of dogs get to Congress at the time, and even the readers thought, this is like before a movie, you know, the little symphony beforehand. What do you call that, you know? Huh? The overture. overture. This is an overture. You know, da -da -da -da. we don't have to pay much attention to this. We're getting on with the real thing. The real thing is we're going to nail this sucker, George III, with all these, these uh, accusations that prove to be you know, justification for our revolution. They change 123 places in the document, in the debate on the 3rd and the 4th. They call themselves the Committee of the Whole. And Adams is defending the document. He's defending it just as it was. And Jefferson says, he defended every one of my words. And they, he keeps losing because people, let's talk, let's knock out this passage about slavery, blah, 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 blah. Um, and Jefferson apparently turns to, no, Franklin turns to Jefferson during the debate. He says, I told you never to write anything to be edited by a committee. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says that there's this funny story about a hatter. Uh, what do you call it? Haberdasher? 
and he wants to have a sign for his store. So he has this long sign, you know, here buy hats at you know so and so so. And a vine, the guy comes in once and says, "No, you know that's too long. We'll take, take out this word. Then take out that word. Take out. And eventually, it's a sign with a picture of a hat. <laughs> that's it. There's nothing else. So that's what's happening to Jefferson's draft. Um, and Adams does his best best to defend it, but the draft that emerges is the one that we now know. And the bulk of scholarly opinion is that the co- coherence of the draft is dramatically improved. All the changes are made in the second two-thirds of the draft. The part we don't care about. The part they cared the most about. Because what's what's going on there, see, almost every colony's got a different history, a version of what's happened over the last 10 years, and they want to be sure that their version is represented in the document. We can't tell that now, but that's what's going on. But the first part, the overture part, they don't touch it. You ever read Mark, uh, the no, Sherlock Holmes, the dog that did not bark? This is the dog that did not, not bark. It's the most important piece of evidence in the story, and it's a non-existent piece of evidence, the fact that the dog did not bark. Jefferson has smuggled... <coughs> the liberal tradition in American history into the document. <coughs> it's buried in there. The guy who will discover it is Lincoln. And Lincoln is going to make a big deal about this. And then Martin Luther King is going to eventually say, when he appears on the steps of, as I've said before, of the Lincoln Memorial, he's coming to collect a promissory note, um, that they, let's, let's say, nobody knew at the time what they were doing, including Adams or Jefferson, but they have smuggled into the founding document a set of values which are inherently utopian. The world that Jefferson imagines is impossible on this earth. A group of free individuals are allowed to coexist harmoniously without any interference and practice what they wish and they will never collide either politically or economically and they will generate collective harmony and economic productivity in the marketplace. This is like the Marxist view of what happens in paradise when the state withers away. It ain't never going to happen. But Lincoln would say, did say, we can keep getting closer. That's what we're doing. I'm getting us closer by ending slavery. Martin Luther King's going to get us closer by ending segregation. Barack Obama is going to get us closer by ending the threat to the planet. That's a, that's to be decided. So it's a set of goals which are inherently unattainable, but which are there to to drive us on. Adams, I'm saying, wouldn't do that. And I'm saying, and we can take these we can continue this discussion next time, but that first of all, that Adams would insist notice Jefferson you, you ever you ever been to a to a, a high school or college graduation? Many. many, many, many. Many. I don't know whether they all do the same thing they do in Massachusetts, but in Massachusetts, they say, "And we award you this degree with all its rights and responsibilities." Now you can say it to the current millennials. Responsibilities, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, but that's not fair to them. But that <laughs> Jefferson is all about rights because he assumes everybody will internalize responsibility naturally. Mm, dream on, Macduff, but nevertheless, <laughs> Adams doesn't think that way. With mutually dependent 
rights, and responsibilities. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit not of happiness, but of virtue. What does virtue mean? Self-sacrifice, the surrender of selfish interests in behalf of the larger interest of the whole or the collective. That's much more in keeping with Republican values at the time in terms of what other people are saying. And among these responsibilities are self-denial, duty to the commonwealth, and a decent respect for the wisdom of the ages. For Jefferson, the past is a dead hand. That's what he calls it, the dead hand of the past. The past is priests and kings, and he believes, as did, I think it's Voltaire, though some say it's Diderot, that the last king should be strangled with the entrails of the last priest. And when that happens, we're out of the cave, into the sunlight, everything is great, and we can live happily ever after. Adam says, no, 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 no. Once you kill the last king and the last priest, then you've got to deal with human nature itself. And it's not necessarily going to be as happy a thing as you believe. Um, that to secure these rights and enforce these responsibilities, governments are instituted in all civilized societies, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and listen to this, from the accumulated experience of preceding generations. See, he wants to learn from history what mistakes did they pay, what can we learn. Jefferson says, history's over, we're into a new era. We're, you know, it's like history's bad, bad. Adam says, no, 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 no. Adams is a historian. Jefferson is a Platonic philosopher. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. We can agree on that. And they can also look back for the last year. Adams has been trying, trying, trying to get the British to understand that they're going to, you know, that they're willing to, to make compromises and they won't happen. And the lamp of experience will demonstrate, he, I like lamp of experience, that human passions aligned with dreams of perfection ought not seduce governments to embrace revolutionary change when imperfect evolution is possible. If you have to pick between revolution and evolution, always go with evolution. And if you have to have a revolution, put it in the hands of conservatives who will do it, imp implement it in an evolutionary way. Revolutionary change is usually impermanent and gets replaced by dictators. Witness Caesar, Cromwell, soon to be Napoleon. We'll go down the road and call, talk about Stalin and Mao later on. That's what happens to revolutions, unless they're implemented slowly and gradually. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind must resist the tyranny of despots and the tyranny of majorities. See, in a Jeffersonian world, the notion that a majority can be tyrannical is inherently incomprehensible. Majorities are, by definition, right, because they're majorities. Not in, not in Adams' world. Not in Adams' world. You know, like, do you think it was smart to, to invade Iraq after 9-11? Hmm, probably not. Why did we do that? We had to. Everybody wanted to do something. Um, majority of opinion in 1954 was certainly not in favor of integration. Um, so majorities, dangerous things. Well, and a, must balance the urge for freedom and their obligation to others. Oh boy, got to tell your students about this, okay? <laughs> and um, I hope this, like for example. How would your students say, react, I don't have mine, say, look, we've got a major problem in the workplace. There's not enough jobs for you, right? We've got all these infrastructure problems. Why don't we say everybody has to serve two years mandatory national service? Doesn't have to be military. Probably won't be. Everybody served. Now, the students I teach say, oh, well, if I do this, my peers will get ahead of me. No, they won't. They'll be working right there with you. <laughs> Everybody has to do it. 
And I think Adams is in favor of some form of, in our context, bringing him, he, he thinks that national service is a good thing and that because you have a commitment to the collective as well as to yourself and teaches you that. It has absolutely no chance of ever passing. Be, uh, but um, that it's, it's something that I think should be inserted into our conversation. And he would, I'm in, and I'm obviously behave, pretending to be John Adams here. He, he concludes in a, in a Jeffersonian way that's right, too. Let these principles be declared to a candid world at, the, at this propitious moment with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence and the civic sense that our mutual pledge binds us together within the expansive limits of our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It's a combination of Jeffersonian lyrics, lyricism, which is beautiful, and, Jeff, and Adams. What do you call it? Adamite? <laughs> you know, Adamsonian? That doesn't sound right. Adam, Adaminian? Um, look, that's, isn't that revealing? We don't have a word for it. We have Jeffersonian. We have Jacksonian. But we don't have a word for Adam, even though he's probably the most brilliant political thinker of them all. It's interesting. There's no word for him. Thank you. Thank you. Join us.